Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. Uh, let me start off briefly by thanking uh, Ambassador Mary Ann Peters, our provost, for uh, her foresight in recently creating the uh, seventh regional studies group here at the Naval War College, uh, focused, a group focused on uh, an emerging region that's of strategic importance to the United States and to the U.S. Navy, and that's the Arctic. And the Arctic Studies Group, like many other th the regional studies group here at the college, consists of uh, students and faculty uh, who have an interest, experience, expertise in, uh, in regional maritime affairs or in U.S. policy and strategy in the region. So not only does the uh, Arctic Studies Group uh, act as a catalyst or coordinator uh, of research to serve the needs of the Navy, Department of Defense, and other elements of the U.S. government, but it also hosts uh, guest speakers and organizes periodic seminars, such as the one that uh, we have here today. This panel is co-hosted by the Arctic Studies Group and the Europe-Russia uh, Studies Group, and it is one of many of events we hope to uh, not only host here at the Naval War College for the benefit of our students and faculty, but for those who are willing to, uh, are able to join us uh, online uh, through our DVIDS webcast. Uh, it's also important to note the uh, remarks made by our panelists today are that of their own and don't represent an official position of the Navy, the Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. And we really do have an exceptional group of panelists here with us today uh, to talk about uh, what is clearly a topic of, a salient topic for the United States and in particular uh, U.S. maritime forces, and by that I mean both the Navy and Coast Guard. And that, of course, is whether the U.S.-Russia reset can benefit uh, from an emerging maritime partnership in the Arctic region. There are three basic tenets that will form our discussion here today. Uh, the first of these is derived directly from the respective Arctic policies and strategies of the United States and Russia. Uh, when you compare and contrast these strategies and policies, uh, as well as the recent commentary from both political and military figures uh, from both countries, you know, a few themes emerge. Um, first, both nations demonstrate a, a common commitment to uh, maintain an Arctic region that's peaceful, stable, and free of conflict. And second, both uh, the Arctic policies of Russia and the United States uh, highlight the need to develop new or enhanced international arrangements and to, uh, and to leverage international law uh, to address shared challenges in the Arctic region. And when you look exclusively at the U.S. Defense Strategic Guidance uh, that was released this past January and the U.S. National Strategy for the Arctic region, which was released this past May, uh, both sets of documents clearly highlight uh, the need to build a closer relationship with Russia uh, in areas of mutual interest. And the second tenet that lies, or that lays the foundation for our discussion here today is, is really a shared understanding of the, the devastating consequences uh, to the Arctic as a result of some type of large-scale large oil spill response uh, or a large-scale search and rescue effort. Uh, and this concern is reinforced uh, uh, through a series of international agreements, uh, mainly facilitated through the Arctic Council, and that's the uh, Agreement on Cooperation in Marine Oil Spill uh, Pollution Preparedness and the uh, Arctic Search and Rescue Agreement. So, I think as the United States continues to develop plans, strategies, and policies uh, in the Arctic region, I think it's important for leaders to, to grasp and, and understand what the Arctic really means to, the, to, to Russia uh, from a Russian perspective. And uh, Roman Kushvich of the Murmansk Institute of Economics was recently quoted as saying that the Arctic has been important uh, for us for many centuries. And it's not only just economics, but our country is a northern country uh, and the Arctic is one of the foundation blocks of our statehood. In the 1990s, a lot of uh, Arctic financing was stopped due to the economic and political collapse, but since 2000, it's reemerged as a uh, top priority again. And this sentiment is shared uh, through various military and political figures uh, throughout the Russian government. But for now, at least from my perspective, it, the million dollar question on everyone's mind is how economically viable the Arctic will be uh, over the near term, both in terms of uh, petroleum and mil mineral exploration, but also uh, the, u the use and development of the Northern Sea Route uh, as an alternative shipping lane that links uh, Asia and, and Europe. And uh, 
that economic viability as well as uh, the commitment to resources is the final piece that will form our discussion here today. And from a Russian perspective, they're, they're fairly confident that, um, that the Arctic will be economically viable uh, over the foreseeable future uh, through implementing various policies and, and practices. Uh, they are, I think they're positioning themselves in a manner to address these demands uh, over their foreseeable future. Conversely, it appears that the United States is uh, more uncertain about how economic, economically viable the Arctic will be. Uh, and give, given today's current fiscally constrained environment, I think it's, um, you know, it appears that they're hesitant to commit any additional resources um, to a region surrounded by so much uncertainty. And I think that's one of the keys uh, that distinguishes both Russia and the United States. Um, but I'm optimistic, at least uh, in the near term, that this region will serve as a forum for cooperation rather than conflict. Um, but and while it appears that the likelihood of conflict is, is fairly low, uh, I think U.S. maritime forces should you know, continue to remain capable and ready to respond to any contingency in the Arctic. Um, we learned from the 2011 Fleet Arctic Operations game that we hosted here at the War College that, uh, among other things, the Navy, and in particular the Coast Guard, needs to build stronger maritime partnerships in the Arctic. And while the Navy has historically uh, sought to build the capacities of other nations' navies, I think at least in the near term in, in within the Arctic, uh, you, may, you may see the Navy uh, looking to other nations to help field their capabilities and build their capacities in the Arctic. And this emerging par uh, partnership paradigm begins with Russia and the United States. And to discuss this topic in, in more depth, I'm joined by four really fantastic panelists uh, and colleagues of mine here at the War College. Uh, first to my immediate right is, right is Professor Pete Pedroso, who is a professor of international law in our international law department, where he specializes in a range of international and operational law issues. Um, he's retired from the Navy in, in 2009 after serving 33 years of active duty service, uh, where he served in a number of key uh, leadership positions. He's an accomplished writer who recently co-authored uh, a book entitled International Maritime Security Law and recently published an article in the uh, ILD series entitled The Law of the Sea and the Arctic. Uh, to his immediate right is uh, Dr. Peter Dombrowski, who's a professor of strategy in the Strategic Research Department. Uh, Dr. Dombrowski recently served as the chair of the Strategic Research Department, director of the Naval War College Press, editor of the NWC Review, and co-editor of the International Studies Quarterly and was an associate professor of political science at Iowa State University. He's, off, he's authored over 40 articles, monographs, book chapters, and various government reports. And to his right is Dr. Tom Fedison, who serves as a professor in the National Security Affairs Department here at the War College, and is uh, the director of the Europe-Russia Studies Group here at the War College. And his 31-year naval career included military assignments as a U.S. Nat naval attache to Russia and two tours at NATO headquarters in Brussels. A former surface war warfare officer, he commanded the U.S. Normandy and the USS William Pratt. And finally, on the, on the end there is uh, Captain Andy Norris of the U.S. Coast Guard. And Captain Norris is a Coast Guard judge advocate uh, who currently serves as the Coast Guard service advisor here at the college and is a member of the faculty in the Joint Military Operations Department. And he's widely published in various uh, various international publications, uh, and recently uh, published a monogram entitled uh, Legal Issues Relating to Unmanned uh, Maritime Systems. So with that, uh, I thank each of you for being here today, and uh, what we'll do is we'll begin the panel by uh, enabling each, each of you to uh, present your prepared remarks, and then what we'll do is we'll transition and field questions both from folks here in the audience on campus, but from those who are uh, joining us virtually on Divids as well. So with that, I'll turn to you, Pete. Okay. Thank you, Walter. Um, let me see if this is working. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm, I'm briefly just going to discuss two areas that uh, uh, where there is a uh, impact between U.S.-Russia relations uh, in the Arctic, one being our maritime boundary uh, with Russia uh, and how that uh, might or might not impact uh, our resource interests between uh, our two countries. And then secondly, I'll, I'll talk briefly about uh, uh, Russia's uh, maritime claims in the Arctic and how those uh, uh, claims uh, could have an impact not only on our uh, freedom of navigation interests in the Arctic, but uh, globally as well. 
as you can see here, um, we've had a maritime boundary agreement with Russia since 1990. It's the second largest uh, maritime boundary agreement that we have with, uh, with any nation uh, in the world. Um, it uh, did receive uh, Senate advice and consent back in 1991. Uh, however, uh, um, the Russian uh, uh, Duma has not ratified it. Uh, as a result of that, it's being provisionally uh, applied uh, through an exchange of notes on a yearly basis, and it's uh, done so every year since 1990. Now, the peculiar thing about uh, this agreement is uh, uh, these special areas, and uh, you can see um, there's two special areas that are on the uh, eastern side of the, uh, of the boundary line and one on the western side of the uh, boundary line. In effect, those, those um, areas, in the case of here and here, are actually part of the Russian exclusive economic zone. And on the western side, that's actually part of the U.S. exclusive economic zone. But pursuant to this agreement, we have uh, um, given the Russians uh, jurisdiction in our exclusive economic zone in the western special area, and they have given us uh, resource jurisdiction in the eastern uh, special area. So that's something that's uh, um, odd uh, in, uh, in maritime boundary agreements, but uh, uh, something of interest here. Again, there's uh, because of this agreement um, is in the Bering Sea. It, uh, as far as fishery resources go, don't really uh, don't see a, any impact on uh, a potential conflict with Russia over fisheries resources because of this. Peter is going to talk in detail about uh, economics, but uh, this region yields about a half of the U.S. seafood uh, catch uh, um, on an annual basis, as well as a third of the Russian seafood catch uh, on an annual basis. Now, in order to enforce uh, um, this boundary, uh, we do have uh, uh, excellent working uh, relations with the uh, Russian border guard, and Andy's going to talk more about that because it's really a U.S. Coast Guard border guard uh, relationship. Uh, but uh, at the uh, most recent uh, biannual meeting of the uh, uh, of the two organizations, Coast Guard and Russian Bo Northeast uh, Border Guard, uh, uh, on the Russian side, they signed a, a memorandum or a document of understanding uh, that provides for joint action for dealing with uh, increased vessel traffic and uh, illegal and unreported fishing in the area. And you can see there that uh, um, fish reinforcement, uh, search and rescue, uh, et cetera, are some of the uh, aspects covered by that uh, agreement. Now, with regards to hydrocarbon um, resources, you can see here that Russia does have a number of uh, um, overlapping claims with some of the other Arctic nations with regards to their extended continental shelf in the Arctic. However, because of our boundary agreement with Russia, we will not have a overlapping extended continental shelf cl uh, claim in the Arctic. Uh, so again, uh, from a resource perspective and a potential for conflict over hydrocarbon uh, resources, I don't see that uh, this would be an issue between the U.S. and, uh, and Russia because we have this uh, pre-existing boundary agreement uh, uh, with uh, the Russians. Now, freedom of navigation is, uh, is another issue. Uh, greater access to Arctic shipping uh, means there's going to be more traffic uh, in the Arctic. Uh, most of that uh, is going to occur in the northern sea route that is operated by the Russian Federation as opposed to the Northwest Passage, which would be on the Canadian side, just because the north, uh, northern sea route uh, it will have a greater uh, uh, ice melt uh, throughout the year. So you're going to see greater traffic, uh, not significant for the foreseeable future, but some uh, increase in traffic uh, in the northern sea route in the foreseeable future. So how does that impact our freedom of navigation interests? Here you can see uh, U.S. national security interest in the Arctic uh, that's put out in the uh, uh, NSPD 66. Uh, you can see one of the uh, uh, one of the interests that we have is ensuring freedom of navigation and overflight in, in the Arctic. <clears throat> and you can see that we've specifically identified the Northern Sea Route as one of the potential uh, areas of conflict with regards to freedom of navigation, uh, because we view that uh, a number of uh, three of the uh, of the uh, straits that are included within the Northern Sea Route um, are uh, subject to the regime of transit passage, uh, and that's something that uh, the Russians don't uh, uh, agree with us uh, on. Uh, so there's, there's a potential that, uh, uh, for, for friction between our two countries as greater access uh, results in the, uh, in the Northern Sea Route. 
How are we supposed to implement this from a, from a Navy perspective? Again, we're supposed to preserve our global mobility, uh, and that's an important aspect of this. Is we're talking global, we're not just talking about Arctic. And we want to be able to project our maritime presence in the Arctic to, to protect our, our national interests. Now, from an uh, excessive claims perspective, we see that Russia draws straight baselines along most of its Arctic uh, um, uh, territory. Um, three areas in particular, here, here, and here, those straight baselines have the effect of closing off what we consider to be international straits, where we have an unimpeded right of, of transit. Now, if we were talking about the Arctic alone, we would probably say, well, who cares? Uh, but we're not talking about the Arctic alone because there, there's about 115 international straits throughout the world, and we can't pick and choose which ones we're going to say we're going to challenge or which ones we want to use and which ones we don't want to use. So if we're going to challenge Iran in the Persian Gulf and the Straits of Hormuz uh, because they have excessive maritime claims that uh, purport to restrict transit through the Straits of Hormuz, we've got to be prepared to challenge uh, Russian excessive claims with regards to the uh, three international straits that uh, are located within the northern sea route. And the same thing with Canada on the, on the, on the Canadian side, the Northwest Passage. The Canadians don't view that as a, an international strait subject to transit passage, but we do. Uh, we, and, so, and so, again, an, an, an area of potential conflict as greater access uh, becomes uh, uh, available in the, uh, um, in, the, uh, in the Arctic. The uh, Russians have also adopted a series of regulations, domestic regulations, to regulate maritime traffic uh, in the northern sea route. You can see here uh, they have uh, reg regulations with regards to navigation, um, regulations with regards to uh, uh, icebreaker assistance uh, and uh, uh, pilotage requirements, as well as restrictions uh, that are regulations that apply to the construction design equipment and manning of vessels that are going to be using the, the uh, northern sea route. Um, now, we have taken a look at all of these uh, regulations uh, uh, from an international perspective, from a U.S. perspective, and all of them exceed what's permissible under international law, uh, as well as IMO standards, International Maritime Organization standards that would apply to these types of uh, domestic regulations. With regards to the regulations on navigation, I haven't listed all the requirements, but you can see here some of the ones that are problematic to the United States. Uh, one, the prior notice requirement. Um, uh, our view is that uh, all ships enjoy a right of, uh, of passage in the territorial sea and a right of transit passage in international straits without providing prior notification to the coastal state. Uh, because prior notification for the no coastal state normally means that they also are going to grant you permission or deny you permission. Um, and in, in the case of Russia, that's, that, that's exactly what happens. They, 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 on, uh, they have the ability to deny permission to transit the northern sea route if you do not, do not comply with, it, with their uh, regulations. Um, other requirements that you can see there, uh, mandatory inspection of vessels, um, icebreaker assistance that must be paid for in advance by the shipping company, uh, the requirement to use mandatory, mandatory uh, routes. Uh, mandatory routes are permissible uh, under international law. They're permissible under, uh, under the uh, uh, SOLAS Convention, Safety of Life at Sea Convention, that uh, is adopted by the International Maritime Organization. However, if you're going to have uh, mandatory uh, routes that apply seaward of the territorial sea, those have to have international approval at the IMO. Uh, and Russia has not gone to the IMO to seek approval of, uh, of these regulations with regards to uh, uh, compulsory pilotage, mandatory icebreaker support, uh, the mandatory routing, uh, et cetera. As I mentioned, uh, uh, our view is that there is an unimpeded right of uh, transit passage through international straits. So those three straits that I showed you earlier, um, our position would be that if we wanted to send a ship through there, that uh, regardless of uh, what the uh, Russian regulations say, that we would have a right to do that. Uh, the other problem with the Russian, Re Russian regulations is that they um, don't make an exception for sovereign immune vessels. So. 
Um, if, uh, if we want to send a warship through there or uh, some other government vessel, uh, as far as the Russians are concerned, uh, they would be able to, uh, to uh, restrict that passage. So again, uh, something that we have uh, serious uh, issues with, um, uh, with the Russians with regards to uh, freedom of navigation. And most importantly, the ones that we're looking at here are the compulsory pilotage uh, requirements, compulsory uh, icebreaker support, and the prior notice uh, requirements that I mentioned earlier. All of these um, uh, types of uh, domestic regulations are permissible, uh, but only if they're adopted by uh, the International Maritime Organization. Uh, also problematic are the, the Russians' uh, uh, regulations with regards to construction, de uh, construction design equipment and manning of ships that are uh, going to be operating in the Arctic. Uh, under the uh, international law uh, that's reflected in uh, the Law of the Sea Convention, Article 21, the coastal state uh, can adopt laws and regulations that apply to construction, design, equipment, and manning uh, of foreign vessels. Uh, however, they must give effect to generally accepted international rules and standards. And that, that means, international rules and standards means approved by the, uh, by the International Maritime Organization. Uh, so you can see that um, many of the uh, requirements that Russia is imposing on shipping in order to be able to transit through the Northern Sea Route exceed uh, both the requirements of the Law of the Sea Convention as well as IMO guidelines that have been promulgated uh, in the Polar Code and most recently in 2009, uh, which are uh, under uh, uh, revision uh, at the IMO as we speak. Uh, now, the Russians uh, base their... Uh, uh, their authority to do uh, what they're doing on Article 234 of the Convention, uh, which does allow the, uh, a coastal state to adopt uh, certain uh, laws with regards to uh, uh, the prevention, reduction, and control of mar uh, marine pollution from vessels in ice-covered areas within their EEZ. Um, however, um, those uh, uh, laws have to give due regard to navigation and uh, have to be based on best uh, available scientific evidence. Uh, the Russians have not put forth any evidence to show us that what they have adopted uh, is based on the best available scientific evidence. And, in, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, they do not give due regard to navigation as provided in the, uh, in the Law of the Sea Convention. As I mentioned, the IMO uh, guidelines for ships operating in polar waters is currently under uh, review at the IMO. Uh, with a view of making it a mandatory code and the uh, expected completion date of those uh, um, efforts uh, it, it will be in 2014. Uh, I don't think that's really going to happen, but uh, we'll, we'll see if they, if they meet their deadline. I, I'm looking more at 215 or 216. So some next steps, uh, you know, what can we do? Uh, one, we have to continue our leadership at the International Maritime Organization uh, to develop a mandatory code um, that is consistent with uh, our national security interests and with our freedom of navigation interests. Um, the uh, Northern Sea Route regulations were recently amended in 2000, in this year. Um, we uh, need to diplomatically protest that. Uh, to show that our show our non acquiescence in in uh, in those regulations uh, in order to make sure that they don't develop over time into customary international law since a lot of countries are abiding by those regulations because they want to be able to use the northern sea route uh, a draft of that uh, uh, protest uh, is in progress i saw a copy of it last week and made uh, made some comments on it so i expect that to happen uh, in the near term and then finally uh greater access uh, to the uh, northern sea route because of the melting sea ice uh, is going to provide us with an opportunity to conduct an operational challenge of these straits. Uh, in the past, we used to conduct uh, challenges of the uh, northwest passage on the Canadian side until we entered into a bilateral agreement with them that we kind of uh, agreed to give them prior notice uh, when we were going to send scientific research ships through the, uh, through the, um, um, through the northwest passage. Uh, which is normally the ships that were, were going through there were our icebreakers, the Coast Guard icebreakers that we had. Um, but uh, now that there's greater access on the, on the Russian side, um, are we going to uh, step up to the plate and uh, operationally challenge our, uh, or provide, send a ship through these uh, three international straits that we consider the right of transit passage to, to apply? And the real question will be, does Washington have the political will to do that? And um, my guess is that they probably don't uh, because it's Russia. So we'll see how, how this all plays out. But we have to be careful that 
that we, over time, because more countries are going to be using the Northern Sea Route and are going to be accepting the Russian regulations, that, there, that, that this state practice doesn't somehow develop into a customary norm of international law and uh, somehow uh, uh, bind the United States in a way that we don't want to be uh, bound. So with that, I'll turn it over to Peter. Can somebody change the slides to the next, or do I just do that? Yeah, I guess I just do that. Okay, um, thank you, Walter, for uh, inviting us and for organizing uh, on behalf of uh, Ambassador Peters, the Arctic Regional Studies Group. I'm very pleased to be included in this uh, present, uh, this body of experts, and thank you all for coming out and taking time out of your lunch. Um, what I'm gonna do today is not talk so much about the U.S.-Russia relationship as the overall 10,000 foot view of the economic dimensions, the, the so-called Arctic opening, basically the, the loss of sea ice and, and its implications. And I'm gonna take this, as I said, at a, as an overview at a, at, a, at a 10,000 foot level, and I'm gonna focus on four areas, uh, shipping, natural, but particularly energy, fishing, and tourism. Um, I should note there are, there are other economic issues in the region that uh, actually have uh, quite a bit of importance for the United States and Russia and the other Arctic nations, um, you know, particularly things like economic development. One of the things that I think Walter and I were exposed to in doing some of the work we did in Washington on Arctic strategy was the importance, at least in the U.S. domestic context, of the state of Alaska and indigenous, uh, indigenous peoples in the region. And I think many of the other states also have similar concerns. I'm not gonna talk about that today, but it is a driver of policy and it's a driver of economic issues, uh, much more than some of us might expect given our normal focus on military and operational and strategic questions. Um, I'm not gonna talk about the environmental issues, which if you, you know, if you think carefully about the environment, there's a lot of economic dimensions to disasters, to changing weather patterns, changing climate patterns. Uh, I'm not gonna discuss about that today because I think uh, there's enough on the plate, but it's certainly uh, something Something that should be thought about and considered by uh, other scholars and students as we as we look at the emergence of the Arctic uh, as a region of interest. The bottom line of what I'm going to, to say today is is cautionary to step back uh, to place the Arctic in context, particularly the economic dimensions of the Arctic in a context, uh, not just of the region itself, but in a wider global context because. Uh, this is where the rubber really meets the road, uh, to use a horrible cliche, uh, for the United States Navy and the United States military, but also for uh, some of the other countries in the region, particularly the Russians. So it's not just an Arctic issue, it's an Arctic is set of issues, it's an Arctic set of issues within a wider strategic context. So um, the, ne the next slide is just, we've all seen the, 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 North the Northern Sea Route and the Northwest Passages. There's people here in this room that are much more expert than I. But what I want to talk about is, and I cannot improve upon uh, Steve Carmel of Maersk's analysis of this. Uh, Steve is a friend of the War College and been here many times, and he's recent, recently given a series of talks and published a series of articles looking at the impact of shipping and the commercial impact. So I'm just going to give you a quote and then talk a little bit about what he's saying. Uh, quote, maritime pundits believe a shrinking ice cap translates into a frenzy of traffic as shippers rush to exploit shorter sea routes. And according to Steve Carmel, quote, they are wrong. And I think that's actually something very important for us all to recognize as we think about uh, the Arctic uh, and the changing ice, uh, ice patterns and flows and the shrinking ice cap uh, to, to think carefully about exactly what it does mean. And Carmel's analysis is based on a number of factors. I'm not gonna be able to, to rehearse them here, but it's the nature of the length of time that passage is actually viable because a shrinking ice cap uh, doesn't necessarily mean ice-free, and ice-free actually matters for the operation of shipping in the region. Uh, just because there is a route open several weeks of a year or longer uh, over time doesn't mean that the, the speed of passage is the same it is in, uh, in warmer waters. Um, it also can't change geography. Uh, the location of the buyers and sellers that want to use this transshipment route, trans, route uh, matters. 
And if you look at the time of, and global supply chains, and Carmel makes this point very well, uh, it's unclear just how much economic benefit accrues from this opening that would lead to this rush to, to transship across the region. Um, the other thing to consider is the costs of this uh, route across the globe. Okay, so it's not necessarily your normal ships uh, that can make this passage, particularly uh, in the, the non-peak period of uh, the receding of ice. Um, there is a whole set of other costs associated with uh, potential problems. Uh, these aren't just on the private industry, but also on governments in terms of, uh, and I'll talk about this sort of at the end of my presentation, search and rescue, hardening of hulls, uh, icebreakers, the necessity of communications that aren't necessarily easy. If anybody uh, has paid attention to the Arctic environment, it is an extreme environment, and things we take for granted in the temperate climes aren't necessarily taken for granted in the Arctic. So the bottom line is the rush to lots of ships, large container ships and so forth going through the Arctic either side of the, the Northern Sea Route or the Northwest pa Passage is probably limited. And I'd really recommend to you reading St Steve Carmel's pieces and proceedings and elsewhere on this particular issue. Um, the second issue I want to talk about is oil and gas re re reserves. Um, and, you know, the estimate, the, this chart which I've put up here, uh, the darker colors represent those where either we have discovered reserves or geologists are 100% certain that there is substantial reserves in that, in that region. Uh, as you go lighter down the shades in the chart, it actually means there's less and less probability that reserves will be discovered. Not uh, no chance whatsoever, geology being what it is, but that the analysts have looked at the geographic data, done the surveys, and said there's, there's only so much here. Now, a, a few bottom line things, again, to say about this. Um, almost all of the existing reserves and the potential reserves, we, the geologists think there's a higher percentage of possibility that new reserves we discovered, are really controlled by simply two countries. And that is the United States, with something on the order of 20% uh, of the oil and gas reserves uh, uh, in the Arctic region under its territorial control. We can talk about what that means, but I'll just leave it at that. Uh, the Russians have uh, roughly 50% of uh, those potential reserves. Now, on one hand, if we're thinking about it at the very first level of strategic and geostrategic thinking, wow, this is a big deal. Um, but if you look at the details, there's actually less than meets the eye. Okay, so just take Russia, for example. Russia is already one of the three or four leading exporters of energy, uh, given uh, not, not from the Arctic region, from Siberia and the rest of, uh, the, the rest of uh, Russia. Um, right now, it has a capacity uh, difficulties in exploiting this. It needs greater investment, greater investment of equipment, exploration, infrastructure to transship the oil uh, and the gas that they, uh, that they have to the marketplace. Uh, it's unclear how much more investment they can sustain for this particular region, particularly its, different, uh, its distance from markets, the expense of attracting uh, Arctic oil, and current market conditions. Now, if you think about it, obviously where's the biggest demand for energy these days? Well, it's China, so obviously there's some potential, and we've seen this already with a number of agreements, for the Chinese to sort of provide some of the resources, provide some of the financing, and even the technologies to, to accomplish this exploitation. Um, the other issue is that for the United States, you know, if, if you've been paying attention to the news lately, um, the U.S. energy position is shifting radically. And there's a lot to say about this, and this is the forum, but basically America is projected to become a net energy exporter in the coming days, days uh, decade, in part because of our increased exploitation of fracking of the technologies to extract uh, energy, both oil and gas and shale gas and so forth, from our own uh, territory. So uh, the, the point being that the 20% of the proven and potential reserves that the United States has within its uh, control in the Arctic while important and obviously an economic boon to Alaska and to other regions, uh, isn't uh, the game changer it might have been at the height of uh, the Cold War during the 1970s when we had the oil crises. Um, and so we need to factor in that, 
the, 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 the shifting nature of energy markets and how the Arctic will affect it, particularly because the Arctic is at a very high uh, cost area to extract, trench ship, to build infrastructure, and so on and fo so forth. I can take more questions on that if anybody has anything, but that's just a general overview. Um, the next issue I want to talk about is, um, excuse me, fisheries. And this is something I knew absolutely nothing about, I haven't really studied. Uh, as I did a little bit of research on this, uh, you know, the assumption is that the changing Arctic, uh, the opening of the Arctic and changing ice patterns and so forth will increase uh, the possibility of fisheries opening up and contributing to the world far food market. I think this is probably, at least as I read the science, and I'm not a scientist, uh, uh, this is uh, less uh, noteworthy than, than some people might think. Um, this chart is just a very simple one. It sort of looks historically at uh, catches of various kinds of uh, fish. Uh, historically, a couple of bottom line things to note in the chart is that Russia, Russian uh, exploitation of Arctic fisheries has declined. Uh, the American uh, exploitation of fisheries has increased. We actually harvest more. These are only, the, the best data I could find was 2000. Uh, that's a long time ago when it comes to fisheries, so things are changing. But what I took away from this is that uh, we're not gonna see an enormous boon in increasing the world's access to protein or decreasing costs of food on global markets based on this opening. Um, and part of this is a question of location. Again, much like the petroleum and energy question, there are some parts of the Arctic that have relatively abundant stocks of commercially harvestable fish, and there's some that don't. Some have been overfished historically. Other ones remain relatively unexploited. So we're gonna see shifts in time. But over the long, long run, um, there's a lot of unknowns, okay, because uh, there's things like acidification of the ocean, the changing temperatures and how fast shift fish stocks adjust and so forth that, that really leave it unknown. But I think the bottom line is we can't expect that this is gonna become a huge resource uh, for the globe or for any of the individual countries in, that are Arctic, uh, that are on the Arctic Circle. Um, now, this may seem strange to talk about tourism in this big geostrategic context, but when I go through the next couple <clears throat> slides and I'll get off the stage, there is a reason I'm doing this because it actually ties into a maritime question. So if you look going back into the 1980s, what you see is uh, almost a 600% increase in Arctic tourism, however you want to define that, uh, over that period. More and more people are going to visit. Uh, the region, uh, they're doing it uh, to see, to whale watch, to see glaciers, to explore wildlife you can't see in, in more temperate climes. Um, the, 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 the commercial sector has actually responded to this demand. There are increasing numbers of hotels and camps and cruises that cater to a clientele that want to explore the Arctic. And again, some, some things we can say about this are that uh, <clears throat> for the most part, it's in the places you might imagine. Alaska, Scandinavian countries. Why? Because they have the facilities and the, uh, the comforts that a, a normal tourism want. Uh, there's actually a, a scholarly literature, hard to believe, on tourism, and basically the analysis says that uh, as the climate warms up, more and more people are gonna wanna go to the region. Where are those, uh, where are those uh, new tourists gonna go? Well, it'll probably be to a large part uh, to the Russian uh, sector of the Arctic in part because that is the most unexplored uh, and there is some spectacular sites to see. So why do I bring this up in this context? Well, almost 99% of all the tourism in the Arctic involves cruise ships. And there is a lot of firms of marketing during the high season, during the part where the ice has receded, uh, trips to go see the glaciers and polar bears and what have you. Uh, some of these cruise ships are actually quite large. What I put up on this, oops, I'm sorry, I went back on. I apologize. Um, what I put up on the screen is just one of the vessels and one of the firms and a proposed route uh, that, that they plan to take in the future. And the thing to, the, the thing to say about this is that um, increased tourism in a fairly extreme environment, even in the, uh, uh, in the warmer months of the year, uh, increases the possibly, uh, possibility of disasters. And this is an issue for the Coast Guards of the Arctic countries, the U.S. Coast Guard, but I think a case can be made that there is actually uh, uh, 
an issue that the Navy needs to be aware of. And part of the reason is, is because as most of us know, uh, the number of ice hardened hulls, ice breakers available, uh, the infrastructure for search and rescue in the region, particularly on the American side, are quite limited. Okay? And as I said earlier, uh, some of the most uh, 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 vibrant parts of the tourism industry actually are up in, you know, through the Bering Straits and up into, into Alaska. Um, so we, we need to think about this in terms of a demand signal, excuse me, a demand signal for um, at the very least thinking through operational and ta uh, tactical is the wrong term in this context, but the operational challenges of operating this environment should the worst happen there be some tourism related disaster. I mean, everybody's seen the Titanic and what happens when a, when a cruiser uh, goes on, uh, uh, excuse me, when a, a, a cruise ship hits or an ocean liner hits an iceberg and you know, that's a nightmare scenario and it's not outside the realm of possibility. And I'm, I understand the difference between a, uh, the Titanic and other kinds of vessels, but in the extreme environment, given the possibility, even the best months of extreme weather, uh, given the possibility as uh, the ice pack melts, there are more glaciers in the, re excuse me, more icebergs in the region, uh, there's a real possibility that there'll be some kind of a tragic event. And at least the Coast Guards and the international community needs to think that, think about it. <clears throat> so, um, to get off the stage and sort of end this very broad discussion of the economic dimensions of the Arctic op opening, I think it's important to note, uh, again, that the region does not have the economic p possibilities some of the advocates and proponents and uh, chicken littles of the world uh, might expect. There are limits. Uh, the American geographic uh, location, uh, yes, there is oil and natural gas, uh, yes, there is tourism, but it's largely a Russian question. And we need to think about this in the context of markets because it's not a zero-sum gain of the 19th or 18th centuries. This is a case where the exploitation of resources in the region is done by private industry, by private contractors and firms, and, and, and mostly they contribute to global markets. So petroleum and gas entering on the global market uh, has an impact on prices across the world, it's not a zero sum where one country or another controls it for their sole consumption or as an economic weapon, but that's a longer story. Uh, on the other hand, for the reasons that Pete has talked about and I'm sure uh, Tom uh, and, and, and others will discuss, uh, you know, there are strategic and, 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 and uh, legal uh, issues and sovereignty issues that need to be discussed, but the economy has, is less of a driver than we might think. Thank you very much. And thank you, Walter and Peter Squared. Uh, what I hope to do in a short time is to give you a Russian look, not an American look, a Russian look at, uh, at the military forces in the area, pre predominantly naval, uh, but 90% uh, of what I'm about to show you comes from Russian sources, except for a couple of the pictures. Uh, and I won't try to editorialize too much. I, uh, what, I'll, what I'll do is try to just stick with the facts, ma'am, and we can take it from there. Uh, what you're looking at right there is in 2007 planting of the Russian flag at the North Pole uh, with a uh, icebreaker and a submersible that went down there, created quite a lot of havoc around the world when uh, the world was looking at the Russians planting their flag there essentially looking like they're claiming the North Pole, not quite so fast, but still it had a, it had a symbolic impact. Uh, you can't read too much about this, even in the Russian press, where you don't see the growth of commercial shipping. And I defer to, to Peter on this subject. I've heard the, the same argument. But the point can't be ignored that the number of transits, and this year the number of permits, that 495 is the number of permits uh, to transit the Northeast Passage is increasing. Perhaps we won't get there quickly, but the argument does suggest that we will get there to the point that some non-trivial percentage of the world's shipping will go through the Arctic Ocean. It'll never become the next Suez Canal, but it won't be unimportant either. In terms of minerals, the U.S. Geological Survey says 25 percent of all the undiscovered oil and gas in the world is up in the Arctic. So, taking them at their word, let's take a quick military look. I just put a couple badges up there, but yeah, that's the Northern Fleet up in the uh, upper right-hand corner. That's the uh, Russian Naval Infantry on the other side. 
but it's more than just the uh, military that's up there. There's also other organizations uh, that have a stake in Russia's claim to its portion of the Arctic, things like the Coast Guard, Interior Ministries, etc. Uh, all right, quickly, uh, reading their documents and believing what they say, uh, what we have is a national security strategy that is predominantly focused on uh, power and prestige through economic strength. There's precious little talk about military expansion in this part of the world, talk. Uh, there is a lot of talk about how important the Arctic will eventually be to Russia. I think it's expected. That's the sort of thing you'd want to see in an NSS. But one of the goals is a permanent military presence in the Arctic, essentially to say, yes, it's ours, and yes, we're willing to defend it. And the fact that Mr. Putin really loves his naval uniforms is a big deal. Uh, I, I will say this, though. Uh, I read enough of the Russian blogosphere and enough of the Russian defense experts talking sort of unofficially. And you don't get quite the same benign talk when you hear a bunch of Navy captains talking about the Arctic. You really do hear much more, or you read much more unofficially about how the Americans and NATO are coming to surround us, especially if our ballistic missile defense shooters go up there. We are really threatened by it. Again, I don't expect to ever hear words like that come out of Putin's mouth, but pretty much all of the, the Russian admirals and Russian captains that I speak to are more than happy to tell us how they're threatened uh, by the Western navies coming up into that part of the world. Yes, they too have a maritime strategy much as we do, and I think maybe you'd be surprised, but it is even less militaristic than CS-21. It spends about 90% of its time talking about sovereignty, economics, territorial seas, freedom of the seas, navigation, protecting human life, protecting the environment, almost as a footnote, they talk about strong naval power in this part of the world. Uh, so, once again, the words are the words. Uh, the actions, to some extent, support this, but let me show you some of the other actions that are going on up there in case you need any of the Cassandra in today's debate. I'll give it to you. Uh, for openers, because the Northeast Passage has been open for the last few years, the Russian Navy has been running a, a, a flotilla through there. Last year, a 10-ship flotilla led by Peter the Great went through, accompanied by four nuclear-powered icebreakers. Uh, the claim by the Navy and by the Defense Department is that the threat is the potential for smugglers and illegal migrants. Uh, but there's also a very clear note that the Ministry of Defense plans to continue this. They've done it now two consecutive years, uh, and there's every indication that they will continue to run naval flotillas up there. Uh, this is a lot of reading, and I don't want you to read it all, but maybe the takeaway here is that it's not just the Navy that's moving up there. Uh, not too surprisingly, Airborne Assault Forces had a big exercise up there not too long ago. Special Ops, a big exercise. Uh, even the Army is planning on uh, sending people up there into the Arctic with, with two what they call Arctic Infantry Brigades, uh, basing more MiGs up there, uh, especially on Novaya Zemlya. A naval base, which never was much of a naval base uh, and basically went defunct on uh, the Soviet Union and then Russia, will now be, at least in their plan, completely rebuilt, um, the Novosibirsky uh, naval base. Uh, Coast Guard, of course, is still active up there along with the Border Guard. Uh, they've just created 10 what they call Arctic aid centers in support of any SAR missions, perhaps with related to the tourist thing uh, that Peter just told us about. But the bottom line is that their walk is present. Their talk isn't so strong. Their walk is happening. They are putting defense forces up there. Are we concerned? Most Americans that I speak to say, no, it's only natural. It's kind of like Americans putting defense uh, installations along the California and Alaskan coasts. I mean, it is their territory. So why should we be surprised if their Marine Corps, Army, and Air Force joins their Navy along their coast? Um, let's see, yeah, let me, let me just offer this though, you know, can they do more? I mean, I'm kind of waving the flag a little bit here, not too many people are waving it with me, but the Russians said they were building ships over the last 20 years. Actually, they really haven't started building them until about three years ago. 
These ships are starting to come off the shipways right now, and you can look at the commissioning dates of this is their surface ships. Are they building nuclear submarines? Yeah, they're building them too. But just their surface ship building plan uh, went from virtually zero between 1991 and 2008 to alive, I mean, I mean, it was dead, then it went from, to, from dead to dormant, and it went from dormant to what I will call alive over the last 18 months. And uh, these are the, the, the number of ships that they do plan to build and when they plan to commission them, and they are commissioning now somewhere between two and six ships a year. Uh, can they go up there? Of course they can, and their position is to have a permanent military presence. So. Uh, I would argue that in, and in addition to this, they're also commissioning additional icebreakers. They have a, a fleet of nuclear icebreaking ships. They're very impressive, as you can see by what I call the world's meanest looking icebreaker. Uh, and they've also got a number of, uh, of rescue and research ships for underwater uh, operations. And they're increasing their budgets here too. They're building nu floating nuclear power station uh, they're building a transportation logistics network to support their offshore uh, drilling, as well as a number of uh, oil platform replenishment ships. So it's real. And I'll just end by showing you a picture of their CNO, who touts the fact that now over $6 billion a year go into their shipbuilding program. That's about half of what we spend, you know, which is about 20 times as much as they used to spend five years ago. So it's real and the fact that he is not at all embarrassed by the fact that his Navy will continue to show a constant presence up there, and he's looking forward to it, and he thinks in the very near future he will have a Navy that can actually do it. So that's the, that's the Russian Navy look at things. And I'll turn it over to the Coast Guard. Let's try this. Thank you very much. I'm Andy Norris, and uh, we'll talk about uh, interactions between the Russian Coast Guard and uh, the U.S. should start out by saying that the Russian Coast Guard is not the only entity that we interact with as their Coast Guard-like functions are spread across eight ministries, and we'll look at those uh, shortly. But we'll, here's what we'll talk about, three uh, general topics. As you can see, the current status of relevant operations interactions, the structure of the Russian ministries that have Coast Guard-like functions, and then uh, a new initiative, the U.S.-Russia Arctic Maritime Initiative. In terms of uh, current relevant operations and interactions, as I uh, characterize them, first of all, it should be mentioned that uh, there is no active uh, commercial fishery in the Arctic region. Obviously, that's something that uh, is anticipated to occur in the coming years, but um, the U.S and the other Arctic nations, the so-called A8, uh, with the exception of Russia, are in favor of a moratorium on commercial fisheries, at least until science has had an opportunity to uh, study the area and uh, help uh, understand uh, sustainable fisheries and, and what it would take. So, but the point being that there is currently no uh, active commercial fisheries in the area. We do have ongoing interactions with uh, Russian agencies on a policy type level. Four of them are indicated here. I'll discuss a few more later on. But uh, first of all is the uh, IMO. Uh, Pete's already talked about this. And uh, the Coast Guard is the lead US agency representative to the IMO with the big uh, thing of interest in the Arctic region being the development of the uh, Polar Code, which, which would mandate construction, design, equipment, other standards for vessels that would operate in the Arctic. Second is the Arctic Council. Uh, I indicate there A8 versus A5. The uh, five, the eight, five nations within the Arctic Council, the A5, the US, Canada, Russia, Denmark, and Norway, that's the Russian preferred grouping for negotiations, for multilateral negotiations. The U.S. insists upon the inclusion of the other three nations which don't actually have Arctic coasts, those being Sweden, Finland, and uh, who's the last one? Um, Iceland. And uh, so that is 
is one area of, call it contention, if you will, but uh, the U.S. does insist that any interactions involve the Arctic 8, Russia often tries to just involve the A5. But be that as it may, the Arctic Council has had, and again, this has been mentioned before, uh, two significant achievements in terms of, uh, of treaties, one being a SAR uh, treaty and the other in the area of uh, pollution. The U.S. will chair the Arctic Council from 2015 to 2017. Third uh, in the areas of uh, policy interaction is the uh, Arctic Security Forces Roundtable. This is uh, co-hosted by the U.S. and Norway and involves flag and general officers from uh, interested nations that go beyond the Arctic Eight to discuss matters of Arctic interest uh, that uh, are outside the, the area, areas covered by the Arctic Council. And finally, the Security and Cooperation in the Arctic Conference. That's uh, hosted annually by the Russian Security Council. It brings uh, together diplomatic level representatives from the eight Arctic states. Further on this slide here is uh, a, a allusion to uh, operational interactions between the Russians and the U.S. Coast Guard. And there are some, and, and particularly, as I think was already mentioned, the area of fisheries. There's healthy uh, cooperation in that uh, area. The Coast Guard district in the area is uh, District 17, and there's interactions between District 17 and their counterparts on the uh, Russian side. That interaction consists of uh, sharing of intel. It also consists of uh, coordination of patrols between the two nations to try to ensure that gaps are minimized in terms of uh, enforcement vessels being on scene. And finally, you can see desired areas of progress there. The biggie would be that uh, memorandum of agreement, yeah, MOU, uh, in, uh, that's anticipated in 2014 that would allow for ship riders, that being Russian enforcement officers riding aboard Coast Guard cutters so they can enforce Russian laws that we would not otherwise be able to enforce and reciprocally U.S. Coast Guard officers riding aboard Russian cutters to enforce U.S. laws that the Russian enforcement vessels may not be able to enforce. So that's, a, uh, that's anticipated to occur and it's a fairly significant de development. Not in the Arctic it, or itself, but these are models for future interaction between the uh, two nations that could later incur in the Arctic region. Somebody already stole this slide from me. The next uh, area of uh, discussion will be this, which you can't see, and I was afraid of that. I do have a, uh, a uh, blow-up chart, which uh, I can make available at the end if anyone looks to look at it more closely. But this is the structure of the uh, Russian uh, ministries. What you need to understand is that the pink colored uh, uh, structures, blocks in there are uh, aspects of, of the Russian uh, uh, government that participate in SAR, search and rescue. Blue are Russian ministries and agencies that have an interest in the Arctic and green are Russian ministries and agencies that have uh, fisheries. So the point being that really across the top, those are separate ministries, and uh, you can see that the Coast Guard-like functions are spread out across a number of agencies. The Russian, and you can't see it, but up, uh-oh. That's not a pointer. That up there is the uh, FSB, which is the successor to the KGB. And uh, that this agency is a law enforcement agency, and it's considered a military organization by the Russians. The U.S. Coast Guard, or excuse me, U.S. Coast Guard. The Russian Coast Guard is uh, within this ministry and the Russian Coast Guard has uh, responsibilities in the area of border protection and fisheries. 
So we do have lots of interactions with the Russian Coast Guard, but they're not in realms that are of, of particular interest to the Arctic because that's not their area of responsibility. Areas of responsibility of particular interest in the Arctic are search and rescue and pollution, and that is under the Ministry of Transportation, which is right here. And particularly within that ministry is uh, the so-called um, SMPCSRA, which uh, is the agency responsible for pollution and SAR response. So we have a number of interactions with that agency and they will be increasing obviously in the Arctic realm. What's of interest with this agency is that it does have some organic assets. So they're the coordinators of Russian SAR and pollution response, but they're not necessarily the asset providers. Uh, they do have, I think the current number is 98, but essentially close to 100 vessels. They have no organic aircraft. They rely upon other agencies to provide assets in the event of, a, of an incident. So again, they serve a coordination role. It's unclear the extent to which they can direct other agencies to provide assets as opposed to request. But nonetheless, this agency here, uh, Emercom, uh, is a, does have assets that are provided for these types of functions. And also the Air Force. The, there's, the Air Force controls all the air assets. So this uh, SP, M, uh, SMP CSRA, uh, does not have organic aircraft, but it does, as I said, have some organic uh, vessels. One final agency I would uh, mention is in this one, also under the Ministry of Transport, that is the newly formed Northern Sea Route Administration. And that was formed this year, and it's going to uh, centralize control of icebreakers, ice pilots, communications, charting, maritime domain awareness and SAR in the Arctic. So of obvious uh, interest and importance in terms of uh, future cooperation and, and coordination between the US and the US and Russia. So that's again the uh, Northern Sea Route Administration. This is the command, uh, I should mention also that the SMPCSRA, the lead Russian agency for SAR and pollution response, does run a number of uh, command centers throughout the country, and this is the main one in Moscow. They have five command centers now in the Arctic, three in the Pacific, and then a few others in the Caspian area and otherwise. And this is, hello. This is a new vessel that's in the SMPCSRA uh, inventory. As I mentioned, they have close to 100 organic assets. This is one of them. 22 of their ships are new in the past two years. So we talked about their recapitalization of the Navy. They're also doing it, obviously, in their civilian agencies. The aircraft in this picture, however, is not owned by that agency. As I mentioned, all the aircraft are controlled by the Air Force. So they'd have to request airborne assistance uh, if, if they needed it. The final point I'll mention is this uh, is a U.S.-Russia Arctic Maritime Initiative. This slide has changed since I made it on Tuesday, or I should say the underlying facts have uh, changed. This is a brand new area, uh, and so obviously the developments are are moving ahead uh, rapidly. This is a result of a uh, U.S. National Security staff, uh, Russia National Security Council agreement, and um, it's one of the Nas U.S. National Security staff's 33 priorities for engagement uh, between U.S. and Russia. And it involves three uh, components. First of all is the Arctic Coast Guard Forum. No involved countries have yet decided what it will look like. The Russians have agreed as of September this year that all eight Arctic nations will be involved. And uh, in terms of Russian involvement, the Russian Coast Guard is going to be the lead agency. What exactly this forum is going to do is yet TBD. 
What has changed since this slide was put together is that what is called part three on the slide is now part two, in that we're moving forward with that, whereas what is listed as part two is now part three, and that that's going to be something to develop in the years to come. So what is now part two is the establishment of this uh, Arctic Maritime, or excuse me, the uh, U.S. Arctic Center for expertise. And the reason why I stumble over that is because that's also been changed uh, between Tuesday and today. That will be called the uh, U.S. Arctic Center for Strategy and Policy. It's going to be located at the Coast Guard Academy. It's going to be a brick and mortar structure. There will be uh, several embedded Russians at this uh, center. And, but it's not just Coast, U.S. Coast Guard. It's going to be the U.S. government uh, center. And thus, uh, NOAA, for sure, and other U.S. agencies will be involved. So they've uh, appointed a director. This is something that is starting, and it's, it's, on, it's on its way. And finally, then, uh, the third uh, component is this establishment of an uh, Arctic Maritime Coordination Center. What that will look like is yet TBD. And I think that's all I have to say. Thanks, Captain Norris, and thank you all for uh, sharing your thoughts with us today. At this point, I'd like to open the floor up to uh, the folks here on campus if you have any questions. Uh, unfortunately, our mics, mics aren't working, so I'll go ahead and repeat the question. Um, any questions, and then go ahead and identify if you have a particular panelist that you'd like to, uh, to uh, respond to your question. Yes, sir. Uh, with regards to the EEZs, the, the, uh, the boundary agreement sets up three special areas. Two of them are on the eastern side, the eastern special areas, are actually part of the Russian EEZ. But the way the line, it was easier to draw a straight line than trying to draw crooked lines. So on those eastern, eastern areas, Russia has granted the U.S resource jurisdiction in those areas. And then on the western side, which is actually the US EEZ, the US has granted the Russians jurisdiction, resource jurisdiction. What does that mean for the fish? Uh, access to fisheries, primarily. Enforcement, jurisdi enforcement jurisdiction in the, over fisheries. There's no, there's, there's no oil and gas being drilled out there. Yes, we enforce our laws in a Russian EEZ and vice versa. It's just like it was our EEZ, but it's really theirs, the way the line's drawn. Um, now, I'll just mention the Greenpeace thing, you know, my cut on it. I, I mean, I think uh, um, the incident occurred on, a, uh, on an offshore platform. Uh, Russia does have exclusive jurisdiction over that offshore platform. It has exclusive jurisdiction to engage in security measures with regards to that uh, to that platform so um, did they have the authority to uh, arrest the Greenpeace vessel that's why I would say yes uh, the question then becomes uh, you know are, when are they going to release them uh, will they prosecute them will they release the vessel there's a case uh, before the International Tribunal of Law see right now where they're trying to get a, the release of the vessel and the crew uh, Russia has said they're not going to participate in that uh, in, in, in that endeavor and I think uh, I forget what the flag stated. Is it the Netherlands, I think? 
I believe it's a it's a, a Netherlands flag vessel. So the Netherlands has brought an action at the at Itlos to for quick release of the vessel and for application of provisional measures to have the uh, crew released. But uh, uh, I don't think the Russians are going to play in that uh, in that in that game because they're they're exercising their law enforcement jurisdiction, and I think they have a legitimate right to do that. Yeah, once they do that, they'll never see them again. And I think, I think the thought there was that since it was Greenpeace, I think there was a sense that there was a little bit of invulnerability. Russia invoked its counter-piracy laws in order to do what they did, probably very legally. Uh, the, the, uh, the talk right now is that having overreacted, here's an opportunity now to show the world what a good place Russia is by slowly letting these people out on bail and setting a better atmosphere for the Sochi Olympics. Let me just comment on the piracy thing. There, there is a U.S. Ninth, ninth uh, Circuit Court that held the exact same way that uh, environmental activism was a private act that amounted to piracy. So the Russians have just copied us. Uh, we just, that, that, that court decision just was held last year. Uh, where we, uh, where a U.S. court said that environmental activism amounted to piracy. Yes, Dean Rubel. Yeah, the question was whether or not the, the Russians uh, corner or um, take Arctic policies, uh, you know, see that separately from other issues such as what's going on in Syria and things like that, uh, whether that has any impact. Um, I'd go ahead and um, open the floor up to anyone who would like to respond to that. I will not comment definitively on this because I, my guess, and this is just purely a guess, is that, is that th they have a local bureaucratic uh, structure much as we do, and they're probably reasonably stovepiped. I'd like to give them credit for having a completely coordinated and integrated foreign policy here. Probably that's not true. Uh, at some point, I guess, when the, when the pot boils over, someone realizes that, you know, uh, the Arctic policy could be screwing up the Olympics. A at a certain point at which I, I think they do get integrated, and perhaps it almost has to get to the Putin level for it to be integrated. But I don't see this wonderful integration, this wonderful uh, uh, planning, this coherency. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of this level of coherency. Yes. I'll, I'll jump in on this, but I think maybe Walter has some uh, thoughts that are worth sharing. And, and, and some of the work we did in Washington, uh, we did bring together representatives of the interagency and the various military commands uh, that have uh, potentially at least uh, uh, a stake in the game. And I think, I mean, UCOM in terms of it wants to cooperate with the countries that it's in its geographic AOR, but they're not eager to jump into the Arctic per se because they don't see where that, uh, they don't see that as the region where their greatest challenges are. So I think it's, you know, yes, uh, some of our partners are deeply invested and involved. Yes, there are initiatives to create new institutional mechanisms within Europe and within NATO, but no, they're not driving the show because they don't see that as their, their primary uh, strategic interest. But you, uh, Walter may have something that's, that's better than that on it. You know, I, I think I share some of the same uh, sentiments, but I think uh, when you look at some issues uh, between NORTHCOM and UCOM, I, I think uh, 
there's many gaps, seams, overlaps in command and control uh, issues uh, between uh, both COCOMs and the fleets, and, and an interesting um, concept that has been uh, toyed around a little bit is the use of fleet forces as the northern fleet uh, for the U.S. Navy um, with, cap with capabilities and assets uh, to at bear. So um, I think both from a UCOM and NORTHCOM perspective, uh, both COCOMs have yet to articulate what their strategic objectives are and uh, what their mission sets are. So it's difficult, I think, for the Navy and in the Coast Guard, per se, to plan for certain mission areas in, in, uh, in field-relevant capabilities when the demand signal isn't there. So I think, um, you know, from a Navy perspective, uh, you know, a little additional clear guidance, you know, from the COCOMs w would, would definitely help. Peter? I just, I just want to add a, a little tidbit to that, which is, I mean, if you, if you look at from a U.S. perspective, actually PACOM becomes very interesting because the bearing is really the gateway uh, to the Arctic, particularly for the Northwest Passage. And if you look at the geography and where, uh, you know, where, where ships pass and where the, the infrastructure is to support those ships, it's, it's a very long way. It actually startled me, even knowing the globe, when you actually look at the distance and the time distance factors to get ships to a particular place at a particular point of time, but there isn't a whole lot of interest on PACOM's part because they say, probably rightfully, that we have other fish to fry. There's this little thing we call the South China Sea. There are these other problems that are more pressing. Uh, and, and like Walter said, uh, you know, Fleet Forces Command and how it relates to NORTHCOM uh, may be the determinant. And the requirements generation piece, you know, the way it works as I understand it, it should flow up from the COCOMs, but if that's not, they're not driving uh, it's really hard to articulate it within the requ requirements de definition process. Thanks for the question. Uh, at this point, I'd like to take one question from uh, one of our viewers online, um, and this is mainly for Captain Norris. And um, you know, with the U.S. Navy's current commitments in multiple AORs uh, and budget uncertainties with threats from uh, sequestration and continuing resolutions, um, where will these these assets come from? Uh, for a potential Arctic maritime presence uh, in the future, is, is, is and the, the response was, is is the better answer to beef up the Coast Guard, uh, and and how could we best attempt to uh, deal with this issue in the current fiscally constrained environment? That's an excellent suggestion. I think we should beef up the Coast Guard. Absolutely. Uh, the reality is, is that um, the budget issues that the Navy's facing are the budget issues that the Coast Guard's facing. Sequestration has effects on the Coast Guard as it does with the Navy. There are resource challenges to expansion into the Arctic. We would, uh, just for search and rescue purposes, as it's been, has been alluded to during the course of the discussions, uh, there's, a, there's a need for assets, there's a need for ships, for aircraft, for shore infrastructure, and um, where are they gonna come from? At what cost? What it's you know it's either going to come from an increase to the Coast Guard's budget or to the Navy's or to the otherwise, which is unlikely, or it's going to come at the expense of other uh, priority in the services eyes at least programs. So the Coast Guard has uh, re is in the process of recapitalizing its fleet, and uh, with the centerpiece center, centerpiece being the national security cutters. So it, our increased resources for Arctic purposes gonna come at the expense of the National Security Cutter fleet. That's, a, that's certainly a, a big question. Where are icebreakers gonna come from? Where's the money for icebreakers gonna come from? And you know, we really have one right now that's, uh, that's operational. There's talk about bringing a second one that's back into operation, but still, I think, uh, I, don't, I don't know the exact numbers, I, I've heard it, and I think it's nine or eight, but anyway, studies have shown the need for eight to nine icebreakers up there, and you know, we've got one. So, yeah, resources, it's a, it's a big issue. Thank you. And I'll, I'll preference this last question here with, with a quote from uh, the founding father and uh, first uh, president of the Naval War College, Rear Admiral Stephen B. Luce, and, uh, you know, the War College was founded as a place of original research on all things related to war, the statesmanship of war, and the prevention of war. And as the Navy looks to enhance cooperation with, with uh, their counterparts in Russia, uh, 
and this question could be for anybody or if, if Peter, you wanna um, tackle it. But where, what are some areas that the US Navy can focus on in the near term in terms of uh, uh, research uh, with their Russian counterparts? Um, so the, the first thing I'll say is I think actually the last bullet or the second to last bullet on your last slide is a good step is that we're actually you know creating some of the intellectual and academic uh, infrastructure to, to think about this more carefully so the Coast Guard Academy's effort uh, is a big step in the, the right direction and the fact that we actually have Russians involved and the War College and the Naval Academy and other US institutions are, are, are cooperating and sharing uh, information and, and analysis is, is a big first step. Um, the, the second thing I would say, which is a, a much more macro point, is you know, regardless of what you think about you know, threats in the AOR, the economic aspects of it, the sovereignty questions, um, you know, to be a player in the region and serve its uh, natural role within the Arctic Council, uh, the United States needs to have capacity on the ground, so to speak, or on the ocean. And the fact is, there are limits. One, one icebreaker, another one that might be able to be brought up to speed, very few reinforced hulls, almost no uh, shore-based infrastructure in the region, very limited comms, uh, reliance on some of our allies and friends uh, for certain kinds of capacities in the region, uh, suggests that the United States doesn't have um, the kind of leadership role or the capacity to lead in the way it might if it actually had some of the assets available. And this isn't to militarize the region, this isn't to make it another geostrategic conflict, but as the region opens up, the investments take a long time to come to fruition and war colleges and the Navy thinking this through today so they can prepare for the 10 or 20 or, or, or 15 years out are, are really essential uh, to build a groundswell of support uh, within Congress, within uh, the nation as a whole, to understand this region. So that, that's that's a very general point. But thank you. I'd offer a, a thought that goes something along the lines of our past history with Russia. Uh, for a long time during the Cold War, we had an incidence at sea agreement, uh, which uh, started uh, very at a very small level, and over the years got to be reasonably significant. Uh, I, I do point out that. Uh, None of this was ever designed to allow us to be allies and work together in war. It very much was picking low-hanging fruit. It very much was simply avoiding accidents and not doing anything silly to one another while saving as many lives as possible. So I would argue probably read what we did with Inc. C way back when, try to emulate that in the Arctic, probably we won't get too far, but we should be able to find enough low-hanging fruit with relation to freedom of navigation, uh, search and rescue, the sorts of things that are reasonably non-warfare related, but can build this sense of uh, uh, security with one another uh, that might eventually parlay itself into something meaningful. But we're not ready, they're not ready, and I think we're not ready for meaningful warship cooperation at this point. Uh, if I could just add something to that as well. Uh, to piggyback uh, Tom's remarks, is that there, of course, there was an adversarial relationship during the Cold War, but uh, the Cold War. But as he uh, indicated, there were areas of cooperation and otherwise. So, for example, in the Coast Guard realm, the Loran stations that the Coast Guard operated, those were operated in close cooperation with the Russians fr during the height of the Coast, uh, the Cold War. I keep saying that, Cold War. The uh, fisheries cooperation, as I mentioned, uh, is an area of ongoing uh, mutual uh, activity that can be built upon. And uh, the, uh, also, the should mention that the Russian icebreaker saving the trapped whales that was memorialized in the big miracle movie. But uh, the, there, are, there, have, there has been a lot of cooperation over the years, and it's a foundation for future interactions. Great, and uh, you know we discussed a great deal here today, and uh, you know I'd like to thank each of our panelists for um, for being here today, and each of you out in the crowd here uh, on campus, as well as those viewing online. Um, but I'd also be remiss if I weren't to thank uh, the folks behind the scenes who really made this uh, event possible, and that's uh, the folks from the Public Affairs Department, uh, the Audio Visual Department, our Events Department, 
and our graphics department. Um, and with that, thank you very much for attending and uh, have a great day.